Good evening, everyone. My name is Carolyn Brown, and I am the Senior Associate Director of Development and Community Engagement at Penn Medicine's Basser Center. On behalf of the Basser Center, I would like to welcome you to tonight's panel discussion, BRCA and ovarian cancer. The Basser Center's Young Leadership Council is a dynamic group of 143 men and women in 29 states, Australia, and Canada who are volunteers and supporters of the Basser Center, passionate about changing the options that currently exist for BRCA mutation carriers for generations to come. The opinions and experiences shared tonight are the panelists' own and do not represent those of the Basser Center, its Young Leadership Council, or Penn Medicine. You should consult with your healthcare team should you have any questions about the specifics of your health and medical plan. Thank you to our panelists for joining us this evening for this important discussion about non-surgical ovarian cancer screenings, preventative surgical options, hormone replacement therapy, and more. Jenny Soren, who will be moderating our panel this evening, is a documentary producer and consultant based in New York City. Her work has been featured across major networks, including PBS, HBO, and MSNBC. In 2018, Jenny learned that she carried a BRCA1 mutation and elected to undergo a prophylactic double mastectomy followed by reconstruction. Jenny is a dedicated member of the YLC and serves as a co-chair for the YLC's event committee. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Jenny. Thank you so much, Carolyn. So I'd like to get started this evening by introducing our wonderful panelists and thanking them for generously offering their time and talent and stories to this event. Um, Dr. Ashley Haggerty is an assistant professor of gynecologic oncology at the Hospital of the University of Pennsylvania. She received her BA with honors from the History of Science, History of Medicine at from, from Yale of Pennsylvania, oh sorry, from Yale University and an MD from Wake Forest University in North Carolina. She completed a residency in obstetrics and gynecology and a subsequent fellowship in gynecologic oncology at the University of Pennsylvania. During her fellowship, she also completed a master's in clinical epidemiology. She currently serves as the chair of gynecology quality improvement and is the physician lead for the gynecology clinical effectiveness team. This year, Dr. Haggerty received the Basser Innovation Research Award. And in addition to practicing the full scope of gynecologic oncology with surgery and chemotherapy, her research focuses on cancer care delivery, healthcare innovation, and quality of care. So thank you, Dr. Haggerty, so much for being here. Um, Maura Morris um, is a CPA who spent a decade in public accounting and recently left to pursue a career in interior design. She resides in Philadelphia with her husband, Brian. Maura learned she had a BRCA1 mutation in 2014. The diagnosis did not come as a surprise as her mother also has the gene mutation and is a breast cancer survivor currently battling metastatic ovarian cancer. Maura recently had a double, had a prophylactic double mastectomy at Penn Medicine in August of 2020. Katrina Wells, our second, uh, our third panelist, is an editor at a healthcare publishing company in South Jersey, where she lives with her husband, three girls, and two dogs. Katrina found out about her BRCA1 mutation in 2013 after her second daughter was born having lost a grandmother and an aunt to breast and ovarian cancer. Since receiving the diagnosis, she reduced her ovarian cancer risk via soplingectomy. I hope I'm saying that right, uh, in 2016 and full hysterectomy in 2019. She blogged her experiences and has written for philly.com as well as US News and World Report. Thank you, Dr. Haggerty, Mora, and Maura and Katrina for agreeing to share your knowledge and experience with us this, this evening. Um, there will be time for a Q&A after the panel discussion and you can type any questions directly into the chat um, and we'll try to get to as many as we can. So um, let's get started. Um, Dr. Haggerty, can you tell us about the ovarian cancer risk for BRCA mutation carriers 
And if there is a different level of risk between BRCA1 and BRCA2 mutations. Sure. Thanks, Jenny, and thank you all for having me tonight. Um, so yes, there is an increased risk of ovarian cancer, as many people on this panel um, this evening may know. The baseline risk of ovarian cancer for people that don't have a genetic mutation is typically quoted to be about 1.3% throughout your lifetime. Um, but women with a BRCA1 mutation can have up to a 40% risk, and women with a BRCA2 mutation can have up to about a 20% risk. And one thing that comes up often is how few tools that we have to detect ovarian cancer, um, especially at an early stage, as opposed to breast cancer, where BRCA mutation carriers are also at a high risk for. Um, so what are the ovarian screening options available for BRCA mutation carriers? And at what age do you recommend that the screening process begin? Yep. And third question to that, what type of doctor should someone in a high risk category see? Um, so we know actually with some data that was published just a couple of months ago that screening for ovarian cancer is actually not effective in the general population, women who are not at any increased genetic or hereditary risk or who didn't have family histories of cancer. That was run out of a very big trial run out of the UK with over 200,000 people. What was not included was women who have this significant increased risk as we just talked about. Um, as I mentioned, that risk can be anywhere from 20 to 40 percent, and it does tend to differ by age depending on mutation. Women who are unaffected with a genetic mutation but develop an ovarian cancer tend to develop it in the average age of their mid-60s, but women with a BRCA mutation, it does tend to be earlier than that. So for women with a BRCA1 mutation, that can even be an additional eight to 10 years earlier than women with a BRCA2 mutation. So any screening intervention that we talk about, the goal is for that to happen before anyone's risk starts to increase. The risk evaluation that we currently have unfortunately is very limited. We don't have a great form of surveillance to pick up a precancerous lesion in the fallopian tube because that's actually where we think these ovarian cancers start. So unlike a colonoscopy that can screen for colon cancer and is a very good screening tool because you might be able to find a polyp before it becomes a cancer and then you can remove that polyp, the same thing doesn't really exist currently for ultrasound. Ultrasound can certainly find something potentially earlier than someone would notice it based on physical exam or symptoms because people tend to not have symptoms from their ovarian cancer until there is you know, widespread metastatic disease. So in that sense, we may find something earlier. We certainly can see abnormal things on ultrasounds that are not cancers too. So it's important to discuss this to balance you know, that, that anxiety that someone may have every time they have a scan, if they find something that's concerning. Because remember, we're looking at ovaries that are ovulating for women who are premenopausal. And ovulating ovaries often make cysts. That's what they do. It shows that you're releasing an egg. And so it's really important to talk to your doctor. You know, One of the last questions you ask is who you should be seeing. Certainly, I, as a GYN oncologist, um, um, I'm very biased to having a GYN oncologist included in this at some point. Um, I think, you know, there are so many nuances that go into having these conversations and talking about cancer risk and what that means and talking about surgery. So obviously, I know that not everybody has access to a GYN oncologist. Um, although hopefully maybe one of the nice things that can come out of COVID is that maybe there's more telemedicine that people can use to see GYN oncologists, at least for a consult. Certainly a gynecologist or at least a gynecologist that sees patients who have genetic mutations does surgery, a very reasonable person to be seeing too. And you can talk about the initiation of ultrasound or even screening with CA125 levels, a blood marker that can be elevated in cancers and the utility of both of those. But we really don't start that until people are you know, well into their 30s. And again, those have some risks and benefits to it. 
SCA125 um, is not a perfect marker for ovarian cancer. It's actually more of a marker of inflammation. So anything that can cause inflammation can cause that to be elevated. So these are important things to know as you're thinking about sort of the, the risks and benefits of doing these tests. Um, certainly, I think always importantly, making sure that you're well connected with your healthcare, that at least someone is seeing you, you know, ideally every six months, what I tend to offer for patients is for me to see them once a year, for them to see their regular gynecologist once a year, and for those to be six months apart. Thank you for that incredibly informative um, explanation. Um, because we are specifically talking about BRCA mutation carriers, who might decide to undergo a preventative mastectomy, um, you know, like uh, Katrina and Maura have. Um, can you talk about the timing of this surgery with the risk reducing gynecologic surgeries that are available? Absolutely. So, you know, certainly what I counsel patients about is, you know, the role for risk reducing GYN surgery. Um, and obviously since we're removing you know, fallopian tubes, as I mentioned, and ovaries, that decision shouldn't be made until someone has done their childbearing. Um, there are some options that we can discuss further along in this panel about what IVF options may exist for someone, um, but certainly, obviously, the recommendations are to wait until someone is, is done with their fertility planning. And then, as I mentioned, since the risk differs by mutation with BRCA1 mutation carriers having an earlier risk of that increased development of cancer, the recommendations are actually for risk-reducing surgery by the ages of 35 to 40, whereas BRCA2 mutation patients, the, risk, the recommendations are between 40 and 45. Again, I tell people, you know, does, is there a case where someone develops a cancer before that, absolutely that general population risk of about one point, you know, something percent still exists. But the vast majority of people won't develop a cancer until later with the goal of this surgery being at least several years before that risk curve starts to take off um, to really do everything possible to surgically reduce your risk. So I'd love to, um talk to Katrina and Maura about their own experience. Um, Maura, when you learned about your BRCA mutation, how was your risk of, ov of ovarian cancer uh, presented to you at the time? And what were the options? I know that you received your diagnosis in 2014. Yeah, um, first of all, thank you so much for having me. Um, so I learned I had the BRCA1 mutation in 2014. And based on having BRCA1 mutation, as well as my family history, I immediately started the annual screening that Dr. Haggerty spoke about. Um, and those are the same options that are available to me now. That hasn't changed in the seven years since I've known I've had the mutation. So I get a CA125 blood level um, assessment test every year. And then I have um, an internal and external ultrasound on my ovaries. Um, but at the time, you know, my mom had already had ovarian cancer, so I was sort of fully aware of the risk of ovarian cancer, and I've been at three different hospitals knowing I've had this mutation, and at each hospital, I felt like my doctors were very transparent that the best option for me will be to get, um, the surgery, get my ovaries removed after I'm done having children. Katrina, um, as, as we mentioned, you have three beautiful girls. Um, you already had kids by the time you learned about um, your mutation and you've already undergone the preventative surgery. Um, how did you come to that decision and um, what was the process like for you? When I found out um, I had a very newborn, she was only a few months old when I found out about my mutation and I lost my aunt when she was in her early forties. So I was already 31 
And the conversations that I had with my general oncologist was, you know, you have a timeline. Uh, you really need to make decisions. She said, I would prefer you have everything taken care of by 35. She's like, but I won't really, really bug you until you're 38. So about five years before the earliest diagnosis in my family. Um, I am one of those people that the screenings made me way more anxious than were helpful because they aren't as useful as mammograms and MRIs for our, our breasts. So I kind of forewent and did not have much screening, but I had a very responsive team between my general oncologist and my general gynecologist that if I had any pains and twinges, any things I freaked out about, then they automatically sent me for my ultrasounds and CJ A125. So what I decided to do was pursue having a third child um, without interventions and came to that conclusion that I was going to try for a six months between breast screenings. And if it happened, it happened. If it didn't, it didn't. Um, and was lucky enough to get pregnant within that time. So I had a third child. And while I was pregnant, I really went into full on planning mode for what was I going to do for my ovarian cancer risk? Cause I was 34. Um, so that was when I met with Dr. Haggerty for the first time as I was like pretty pregnant, I think at that point, cause I was gung ho that I should have my fallopian tubes taken out like at delivery. <laughs> I was like, if I have to have a C-section, I want my tubes out right then and there. And everybody had to kind of like talk me down. They're like, you don't have a C-section for this reason. I'm like, okay, okay, I get it. But I totally had everyone lined up. If I need an emergency C-section, like you're calling Dr. Haggerty, she's coming to Penn and she's taking my tubes out if I have to have a C-section. But I didn't need to have one. So what we came up with was this plan and we were very you know, proactive about it that at six weeks post birth, I went in and I had my esophagectomy. And this was a conversation that I had with Dr. Haggerty that I had um, with Dr. Bradbury, who's my general oncologist, that this was the best choice for me. It took a weight off my shoulders, but it didn't put me into immediate menopause. So I was 34 when I had it done. Um, and it kind of just bought me a few more years with my ovaries without going to, into menopause, but also not needing birth control, which is also a risk reducing measure, but I already been on it for five to 10 years, which is the kind of recommended area. And um, it took that weight off. It was a relatively easy surgery. Obviously there are risks and you get canceled on all of those risks, but of the many surgeries I've had due to BRCA, this was the easiest one. Um, I worked closely with Dr. Haggerty. I pumped before I went in. I had the fastest acting anesthesia and I pumped when I came out and I was able to nurse my child that night like because I hadn't gone through with a mastectomy yet. So all of these things factored into why I chose the sopingectomy first, um, mostly because I wasn't ready for menopause. I was also postpartum. There were a lot of things that I didn't want to mess with my hormones with removing my ovaries. And then um, I chose to do the full hysterectomy a few years later when I was ready. I was hitting up on that 38 number that was going to start to worry everyone um, and just decided it kind of was the right time for that move. And I chose to have my uterus removed because I figured it was going to be an anxious anxiety thing. I was going to freak out if I had any post hysterectomy bleeding. Um, obviously, Dr. Haggard kept counseled me in that, like, this is a bigger surgery. There are more risks, but here, you know, what we've come down to is that was the best decision for me in particular. Um, and then went on hormone replacement therapy for myself, um, and keeping myself, um, as healthy as I possibly can. Katrina, you are a superstar in every <laughs> sense. You are unbelievable. So thank you for sharing that. Um, so Dr. Haggerty, Katrina mentioned that she underwent her surgery in two parts, mm -hmm. first removing the fallopian tubes and then having a full hysterectomy removal of the uterus. Um, can you tell us why some doctors recommend removing the fallopian tubes first? And if there are other surgical options to decrease, um, risk of developing ovarian cancer? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, as I mentioned before, we now know over the last you know, 10 years or so that, that at least high-grade serous, the most common type of ovarian cancer, starts in the fallopian tube. Um, and so um, 
the, the fallopian tube though is, is open to the ovary underneath of it and, and open to the entire abdominal cavity. So we are not yet at a place that we feel like just removing the fallopian tubes is risk reducing enough. Um, but obviously as Katrina mentioned, it will certainly provide you excellent birth control. Um, and we've known for, for years that a tubal ligation is actually preventative in a risk reducing fashion. So, you know, a pretty significant decrease in the risk of ovarian cancer in just the general population, such that actually now when people are getting their, their tubes tied, they are now just taking the whole fallopia tube with the goal that in the future, this may help decrease the general risk. And so for women, who have completed their childbearing early um, are in a time frame where there is, you know, at least a couple years between when they would consider getting their fallopian tubes out and then delaying the ophorectomy or removal of the ovaries. That's a, a very reasonable strategy. I, I can tell people that that the theory is there for sure. I cannot give you any data that that definitely reduces your cancer risk. It makes a lot of sense of why it does. Um, and, you know, it's just balancing those risks and benefits, as Katrina mentioned. You know, it is two surgeries, although, as Katrina said, it, you know, it does tend um, to be a surgery that is a relatively reasonable recovery, although we do tell people that it's typically about six weeks with no heavy lifting or vigorous exercise. We don't want people to get a hernia. Um, so it really becomes very individualized for someone's medical history, surgical history, if two surgeries make sense. Um, but it is certainly an option to discuss. And, you know, plenty of people have their fallopian tubes removed just for a contraceptive reason. So it's also just an excellent form of birth control, as we mentioned. Um, I think, you know, it really becomes a, a question that we are trying really hard to solve for people. There are some trials that um, are ongoing. One is called the WISP trial that looked at this. There was some preliminary data that's been, been studied. Now, unfortunately, you know, it's going to take an additional 20 years at least for any of these trials that we're looking at to have any cancer outcome data. For, for this, um, but certainly when we look at the trial that had been done and it was studying the effects of menopause, obviously delaying the removal of the ovaries delayed any menopausal symptoms. So we know that that works, you know, removing the fallopian tubes really shouldn't affect the hormone levels. Um, and so for some women, this is sort of a nice happy medium of how to approach this. I think the other thing I'll just comment on um, is what Katrina was mentioning, you know, is that that role at your C-section. So as I mentioned, many um, OBGYNs at the time of, of C-section, if someone was planning a tubal ligation, um, they are now removing the whole fallopian tube. So, um, you know, that, that isn't as crazy as Katrina was making it sound that, uh, that you know, a team would run around and, and make sure that that happens. I think the important thing is that, as I mentioned, since we know that, that ovarian cancer starts in the fallopian tubes, when we do the removal of the fallopian tubes for risk-reducing surgery, we actually have a very specific protocol that the pathologists use, and they take a lot of sections through the end of the fallopian tube called the fimbria to make sure we don't find a microscopic cancer or a precancerous lesion that we now know exists there. So it's really important that you make sure that whoever is doing your surgery and your pathologist, you know, know that this is a protocol that should be used to look at your fallopian tubes. Thank you. And before we before we go over to Mora, um, Dr. Haggerty, I'd love for you to just explain a little bit that for someone in Mora's situation who does not yet have kids, but is nearing the age where someone would recommend undergoing a preventative surgery like the ones that you just mentioned, um, what is your advice in terms of preparing, you know, what she should expect as, you know, someone in her early 30s? Absolutely. Um, you know, obviously, um, many people are making their fertility decisions still and maybe have a very definitive plan of when they'd like to try to get pregnant or don't have a plan at all. And, you know, that really drives things mostly. You know, we certainly see women who 
maybe someone had a new diagnosis and they're in their mid 60s because their daughter had a breast cancer and was diagnosed. So there are certainly patients that I see um, that are newly diagnosed much later in life. Um, again, you know, those are patients obviously then we want to try to get to the operating room as, as soon as possible. Um, but you know, it becomes a very individualized discussion. I think it's really helpful though, to start to talk about what surgery means, what it looks like, because that really helps inform your fertility decisions. I always make sure patients are aware that they can see a reproductive endocrinologist and undergo IVF. And you can do pre-implantation genetics where you can screen for embryos that don't carry a mutation and implant those embryos. I think that's just really important to know. And then obviously we do know that birth control, birth control pills, and actually even some data to show that progesterone IUDs are helpful to decrease ovarian cancer risk. So, you know, and, and the benefits of that outweigh any theoretical risk of a breast cancer. So we feel really strongly that if someone's not actively trying to get pregnant, to know that it's actually safe and perfectly appropriate to be on birth control. Thank you, Dr. Haggerty. So Maura, I know you've been thinking a lot about this and have given it, um, you know, a lot of thought. How has your family planning uh, been affected by your risk of ovarian cancer after, you know, going through the, the surgery that you already went through? Yeah, um, it's definitely been a balancing act. Um, for me, it was very important to have my mastectomy after I was married, but before I had children um, and I had some complications in the reconstruction process taken me a lot longer than I expected. So my family planning has kind of gotten pushed back a little bit. Um, I am 32, I don't know if I mentioned that before. Um, but other than that, I would say it hasn't been overly affected in terms of age of having children. I always imagined I would have children before the age of 40. Um, so in, in that regard, I feel pretty comfortable. In terms of IVF, I have been aware, you know, since I knew about the BRCA gene that this would be an option, I think. For me, I've decided um, this isn't for me. I think sort of a combination of just personal decision as well as I feel like my body has just gone through so much with my mastectomy and my failed reconstruction and my surgeries to correct the reconstruction. And so, unless I have trouble getting pregnant naturally, um, I don't plan on doing IVF, but it's certainly not an easy decision. Um, Jenny and I were talking about this before the panel started. I feel like some days, you know, five years ago, I was waking up like IVF is the best option. And some days I was waking up like, no, like I wouldn't be born if, if my mom did IVF. So it's, it's a very complicated subject. And, um, you know, I encourage women to, there are a lot of support groups available to talk about the, the difficult subjects like that. Um, and it's, it's easy to talk about it with other people with the BRCA mutation, but that's where I'm at right now. Thank you so much for sharing. And maybe we'll have another panel discussion on it because it, it is something that weighs on the minds of, of all of us, you know, and um, it's amazing that it's an option, but it's also like none of us would be here. So you bring up a really great point. Um, this is kind of changing topics, uh, but Dr. Haggerty, can you uh, tell us what surgeries that are available um, for, uh, what surgeries are available um, that might induce surgical menopause and how this differs from regular menopause? Yeah, absolutely. So. Um, you know, as we're talking about, you know, ultimately the recommendation is for both the fallopian tubes and the ovaries to be removed. And by removing the ovaries, obviously your ovaries are what make up the majority of your hormones, like your estrogen and progesterone, although some fat cells make estrogen and there are some other sources, but it's primarily from the ovaries. The average age of menopause in the U.S. is about 51, so we're talking about those age range recommendations, 35 to 40, 40 to 45, you know, can be dramatically younger than just natural menopause. And natural menopause is a process that tends to, like, 
ebb and flow over several years, really, you know, up to eight, 10 years, even if you started to, you know, check people's hormone levels. Whereas when we remove the ovaries at the time of surgery, that is just an abrupt drop in your hormones, especially the estrogen. Estrogen is the most important hormone that we're talking about here in terms of affecting, you know, menopausal side effects and symptoms, hot flashes, vaginal dryness, mood changes, sleep disturbances. And then it's also the estrogen that has the, the real long-term effects that we also talk about. You know, I feel very strongly that I'm offering people a very dramatic way to reduce their cancer risk. And I see and treat ovarian cancer all day long. So I know how important that can be. Uh, but at the same time, we know there are some real risks associated with early surgical menopause or any sort of early menopause. Um, you know, heart disease, issues with your bone density and fractures, those sort of longer, you know, cognitive dysfunction, just that kind of mental fogginess and, and those, you know, more executive functioning brain functions. Um, and, and those are real too. We do feel that as long as someone is a candidate for hormone replacement therapy, that it's very reasonable to discuss and offer hormone replacement therapy to try to bring back those levels to physiologic levels and to continue that, you know, at, at least typically to the average age of menopause, as I mentioned in the U.S. is 51. That's actually really important to talk about because the surgical options that we talk about and we offer may differ from the hormone replacement therapy side of things. So if you have a uterus, you need progesterone too. You can take just estrogen. Unopposed estrogen or estrogen by itself without progesterone will give you a, a uterine cancer, an endometrial cancer. And so the reason I always bring this up when I'm talking to people preoperatively is that talking about how we would potentially give someone back hormone replacement therapy is a, is a part of that discussion. It brings up, is there a role for hysterectomy? And so obviously someone may have an indication for hysterectomy for some other GYN reason. Someone has huge fibroids, et cetera. Plenty of reasons that women have a hysterectomy. Um, but certainly the discussion of how hormone replacement therapy impacts the role for hysterectomy is, is really important too, as there's some people who have tried progesterones before it and just don't like them, can't tolerate them, don't want them as there's, you know, maybe some theoretical concern of increasing the risk of breast cancer. The other reason to talk about it preoperatively is if we're not doing a hysterectomy and we're leaving the uterus behind and just taking the fallopian tubes and ovaries, a nice way to give progesterone as your hormone replacement therapy is with an IUD or an intrauterine device. So a really tiny T-shaped plastic device that daily releases progesterone, but that can actually be put in in many places at the same time in the operating room at the time of your surgery. So, you know, we certainly put in IUDs all the time in the office. People get them in the middle of their day, um, but obviously if you're already in the operating room, it's also reasonable to discuss if that's a facility that's able to place that at the same time as well. Thanks, Dr. Haggerty. Katrina, now, someone um, just put an interesting question in the chat that relates to the H HRT, hormone replacement therapy. Um, what were kind of the immediate side effects you experienced after the hysterectomy? And then um, what is your advice for people preparing to undergo this surgery or who recently did in terms of adjusting to the effects of that surgical menopause? So my biggest piece of advice is in your pre-op discussions with your gynecologist, oncologist, get your referral to a gynecologist that specializes in surgical menopause. There is the national or the, it's NAMS, it's menopause.org. You can find a, a gynecologist, like your general gynecologist who is very specialized in menopause. Get that set up, that appointment set up before you go into your surgery. Um, that person will help you long-term to be able to manage your menopause symptoms. Dr. Haggerty and her team can prescribe the initial dosage, but when you're working to find the right dose for you, you're going to want to be working with, you know, a gynecologist or an endocrinologist, I guess, if that's what's available to you in your area. That's my biggest piece of advice because 
the very specialized gynecologist that really knows surgical menopause can sometimes be very difficult to get into. So you want to get that appointment set up for, you know, a couple of weeks after your, uh, your surgery with Dr. Haggerty's team and a lot of other teams, they did not put me on hormone replacement therapy immediately because of the risk of blood clots, the same as you were used to with birth control, et cetera. So there was like a two week period where I didn't have hormone replacement therapy. And unfortunately, all the signs that they tell you to look for for infection are also the signs of a hot flash. Uh -huh. <laughs> I took my temperature so many times in like the two weeks after surgery. And I'm like, I have a fever. I have to have a fever. I must have an infection. And I'm like, I don't have a fever. What is it? I was like, oh, oh, this is a hot flash. It took me like a couple of times to take my temperature and trying to figure out what the hell was going on. So hot flashes were, I wouldn't say immediate by any means, but like within days of my surgery, I had hot flashes and they suck, but that's okay. It was for the greater good. Um, and very honestly, once I started and I'm just on the patch and part of why I had the full hysterectomy was because I wanted the easiest path to managing my hormones post-op. Um, so I, uh, once I've been on the patch, it's honestly been great. I had to go off the patch for a recent surgery and the hot flashes came back with a vengeance. Um, that's been the biggest thing for me. Other than that, you know, there's mood swings, there's all of that good stuff, but none of that has severely impacted my life. Um, so much as the hot flashes, um, I did get set up with a great gynecologist at Penn and have had great conversations with her. She was like, no, you're, you know, you start on the lowest dose and then you move your way up and worked with me on that. She'll manage my bone density, um, I'm actually starting potentially a clinical trial for it's an ADHD medication to like help kind of clear the fog up. And I think that's more things you don't notice till someone starts asking you all those questions. They're like, do you do this? Do you do that? And like, mm, I do. Um, so there's things I think that, that happen and, and that you manage throughout your life. You're just used to doing some of these things. Some of those things i referred to pregnancy brain for a really long time. And I'm like, maybe it's not that anymore. <laughs> Cause you know, the kid's six years old, um, the last one. <laughs> so maybe it's not that anymore. So there's a lot that goes into it, but I think that's the biggest thing about finding, you know, a guy and who is very experienced in this is that they know that even though we have a mutation in our BRCA gene, that hormone replacement therapy is no longer contraindicated and you don't have to give up that part of your life and you can be on it until 50. And those are all really important things. You can try to go without it if that makes you feel better and it, it helps your anxiety. But for me, I wanted to be able to maintain my relationship with my husband, to maintain my job and to, you know, not worry about all of those emotions and whatnot with my kids either. So it has been to me a lifesaver. Like I, I know when it needs to get changed, I can start to feel different things. I, I know if I like missed a day and I changed it a day late, like I can tell you right away when those things happen. So it really has been impactful in my life and helped me keep my life to where I'm happy. And it's, you know, worth all the steps I took to get here. Are there any risks, Dr. Haggerty, um, in terms of BRCA mutation carriers using HRT, hormone replacement therapy, and how, you know, it was the, definitely the right decision for Katrina, as she mentioned, but how do you and your patients decide if uh, this is the best option for them? Absolutely. Um, so obviously there are a list of things that make hormone replacement therapy or even birth control pills not allowed for various medical conditions. So you know, always best to talk to your doctor. There are some things and um, some diagnosis that hormone replacement therapy is not allowed. Um, the the um, alternatives, there are ways aside from, you know, the estrogen patch to manage, um, hot flashes as Katrina was mentioning, interestingly, some of, uh, the depression medicines were found to actually be very effective. Um, a rare blood pressure medicine is found to be effective. So there are management options. If you are someone that cannot take estrogen, otherwise, um, you know, there have been many studies that looked at hormone replacement therapy. So, you know, a, a decade or two ago, everyone was on hormone replacement therapy. They did some big trials in the general populations um, that showed that maybe hormone replacement therapy 
didn't solve the problems that they thought it was going to solve for the general population and had some risks, blood clots being one of them. There's a lot of um, controversy over those studies and how they were done, and they are totally not applicable to premenopausal patients who are undergoing surgical menopause early. So those were trials that looked at postmenopausal, like in their 60s. So that's just not the same group of patients to be applying those findings to. Um, and so I think that's very important to know because you know, the pendulum about hormone replacement therapy sort of swung back to the use it just for people who really need it, lowest dose for the shortest amount of time possible. And that's true for people in their mid, later 50s, early 60s. What we're trying to do here is give back the physiologic dose of estrogen that you are losing with your ovaries. Um, I saw a chat in the in, uh, in the chat, that is the patch that we're talking about. It's an estrogen patch, a way to give back estrogen. You can take it as a pill. You can use a ring that gets placed in the vagina. You can put a patch. There's all different ways. That's what Katrina was referring to about talking to your gynecologist about the different routes of having hormone replacement therapy back. Um, but there have been studies that have been done specifically with BRCA carriers to say, is this safe given the general cancer risks that we know of? And obviously they're not, you know, trials that have hundreds and thousands of women in it, but they're very, you know, appropriately done studies. We feel strongly about them, especially here at Penn and feel that that definitely indicates that it is, you know, safe to use hormone replacement therapy from a cancer standpoint. Obviously all of the other medical conditions need to get taken into consideration. That's a great, that's a great place to stop and um, talk about a question that I'd love to ask um, all of our panelists. Um, we've heard feedback from some of our YLC members that some doctors, um, including gynecologists, aren't always sure what to recommend in terms of ovarian cancer, cancer prevention for BRCA mutation carriers. Um, so I guess, Maura, what was your experience like in finding a doctor? And do you have any advice for people looking uh, to help them navigate ovarian cancer surveillance like you are doing right now? Yeah, my, I mean, my experience was good. Um, in each of the three cities I've lived in since I've known I've had the BRCA mutation, I've had a genetic counselor at my disposal who then, um, like I think I said earlier, recommended me to an oncologist who it sort of tracks all things BRCA for me. Um, I know this isn't always available to everyone. So, um, and, and Dr. Haggerty, yeah, you can probably speak better on this to me, but I guess I would recommend to, definitely bring it up to your gynecologist or your family doctor, um, especially with BRCA being such a hot topic right now versus, you know, many years ago, I'm sure your family doctor should at least be prepared for these questions. If you have a history of ovarian or breast cancer and either your dad's side of the family or your mom's side of the family. Um, so that would be my best advice. And then those doctors could recommend specialists for you to see um, in the area or next steps forward. And Katrina, what about, um, you were you know lucky enough to find Dr. Haggerty, but what about um, any advice for just kind of your approach? Yeah, I think for me, because I, I had done some research and had found that I thought salpingectomy would be what I wanted. I knew that I could potentially come up against physicians who did not think that that was the right path because it didn't have enough data, didn't have enough um, oomph behind it, especially given my age and getting close to when I should just get it all done. So for me, it was really finding someone who I saw in the research, in the literature that was doing this stuff and was thinking about it in a different way. And then meeting someone like Dr. Haggerty who was the similar age and, you know, some had understood my concerns. I'm like, I don't want to go into menopause at 32, you know, like, what do I need to do? And so for me, it was really about finding someone that supported my decisions because they were the right decisions for me, not because, you know, I forced them into it, but finding someone who understood my rationale 
talk to me about the real risks. I, I don't want someone to sugarcoat it and do it just because I want to, but talk to me about what where the risks lie and, and where the benefits lie. So for me, it was really finding someone that met me in the middle and talked to me about it and, and helped me get to accomplish what I wanted to do with the right mindset. And, you know, I, every patient is going to have, you know, their own approach, but what would you say to someone, you know, who might not be in an area near, near somewhere like Penn medicine, for example, um, in terms of finding some help? Sure. Absolutely. I mean, from, as Maura was saying, many medical oncologists, general oncologists, um, often, uh, you know, see, uh, hereditary cancer syndrome, see people who have not yet been affected by a cancer, address it um, from the cancer standpoint. You know, there is a huge shift in actual cancer treatment now with precision medicine, and that's based off of various either genetic mutations or mutations in the tumor. So, you know, really general oncologists do have a lot of knowledge about this. I think certainly, you know, I know not everybody has access to a GYN oncologist. Um, you may have access to them for at least a one-time consult, but it might be easier for you to have surgery with your regular gynecologist. And that's certainly very reasonable too. You know, there's nothing different about the procedure as it's sort of laid out and structured for specifically what we should do at surgery um, compared to what a general gynecologist does aside from some of the specific pathology things that we mentioned. Um, you know, so as long as you are seeing someone who this is something that they see, you know, it's always a great question to ask your doctor, how many people with this type of thing do you see? Um, or how often do you do this type of surgery? that is a fair question to ask. No one should ever be, you know, offended by that question. That is a very appropriate question to ask your physician. That's really great advice. Um, so we have about 10 minutes left and we'd love to get to some of the um, audience questions, but I'd love to ask our amazing panelists if they have any final thoughts or takeaways that they'd like to share. And just again, a huge, huge thank you for um, coming on and, and sharing your stories and helping so many other people uh, get through this. I think my only piece of advice would be, um, and I think you've heard us say a, a lot of this, you know, this is a lot for a one time 40 minute consult that you're scheduled for perhaps. So don't feel bad if at that first consult, even if you're in an age range that feels like the right time for you, you know, take the time to, you know, know what works for you, ask the questions that you need answered, have things thought about, planned, you know, recovery, all of these things. So in that sense, it is not unreasonable to even start the process and see people at least for consultation earlier than when you're otherwise planning surgery. There, there's nothing wrong with that at all. That's actually incredibly helpful to get all of the information so that you can make the best decision. Katrina or Mora, do you guys have anything else you'd like to add um, before we take some questions? Katrina, I'll start with you. Yeah, I think just remembering that knowing you're, you have this risk is already being proactive. So don't feel like you have to take steps just because that's what the guideline says. You know, I did choose not to do surveillance until I hit 35, until I felt like I was actually at risk. Um, and be reasonable and understanding what that these tools don't tell you everything. You know, it's funny, like I forgot about it until I, we were talking about it, but pre-op for my hysterectomy, they take your blood work and they do all that stuff. And my CA-125 was at like a thousand and they, we must have hit ovulation like on the day that they took my blood work. So Dr. Haggerty calls me before she's like, don't freak out when you go into your patient portal, your CA-125 is at a thousand. There's no reason to expect anything in your surgery that it's an issue, but that's what it measures. It measures inflammation. It doesn't measure ovarian cancer. So like, I tell that story all the time because people freak out when their CA-125 gets, goes up by three points. And I'm like, mine was at a thousand and we found nothing in my surgery. There was nothing to freak out about, but that happens. And so knowing what 
you need to do for your own mental health going into this whole screening process, make sure you're, you're taking care of yourself mentally as well as physically. Maura, what about you? Any, anything that you'd like to add as you kind of Katrina's on the tail end and you're kind of embarking on this, this journey? I would say it's important to be your own advocate, I think, especially for women like me who are in a surveillance program. Um, a lot of the symptoms of ovarian cancer mirror your normal period symptoms, bloating and constipation and lack of appetite. And um, I think Katrina mentioned the same thing. I've had several instances over the years where I felt like, oh, I have these weird period symptoms or maybe I think are ovarian cancer symptoms and I've called my doctor and had extra screening and luckily it's never been an issue but I think that's you know the scary part of ovarian cancer is that like Dr. Haggerty was saying by the time you have the symptoms it can be very far along and the symptoms are so unrecognizable so I would definitely say be your own advocate um and to mirror what Katrina said, you know, mental health is very important too. Um, I've been seeing a therapist on and off since I've learned I've had the BRCA1 mutation, and that has made such a positive difference for me in my life and learning how to sort of reframe these, you know, daunting worries and the stress that comes with it. Um, so that's been super helpful to me. And I think, you know, taking care of your mental health is is just as important as taking care of your physical health. So well said, um, all of you. Um, and thank you so much for, again, sharing your thoughts and experiences. I'm going to uh, turn it over to some audience questions, which I think will be most relevant to Dr. Haggerty. So we have her on for just a couple more minutes. Um, so this is a question that's come up. How do breast and gyno oncologists determine the age range for these surgeries? You know, so yeah. Um, so you know, the, the there are national guideline recommendations from what's called the NCCN, and um, they are you know an excellent resource. There's patient facing data there too, so you can go on to that. You can just Google NCCN, um, but the the age range is. A, a time to intervene before we know that the risk increases significantly. Um, and so that's been studied just by sort of general population studies of, um, you know, when people develop cancer um, with uh, either BRCA1 or BRCA2 mutation compared to the general population. Um, and so that, that's where those age range recommendations come in. There are, you know, as you all may know, there are other genes besides BRCA1 and 2, PALB2, RAD51, C, and D. So we know of more and more genes. Um, and as they learn more, the age ranges for those genes become updated. They are maybe not the, the same uh, you know, high percentage risk, they're um, a little bit of a later age, some of them. So it actually becomes very specific for what type of hereditary cancer gene you have. And another question that's also come up a couple times is how long is it safe to take hormone replacement therapy for women who are, you know, over 50? Yeah. Um, I think it depends on what you mean by safe. Uh, so, you know, the, the, again, that gets back to some of those studies about hormone replacement therapy and sort of this um, approach to hormone replacement therapy of sort of the lowest dose for the shortest amount of time possible. But again, that this is different. The role of this is to give you the hormones that you otherwise would have had until you got to whatever the average age of menopause is. Now, again, as I mentioned, average is 51. So there are plenty of people who are 49, 48, who are going through menopause. Technically, the definition of menopause is one year without a period. Um, you know, there are some hormone tests that you can see, but, but truly that's the definition. Um, but that also means that there are people who are 52, 53, 54, who are still intermittently getting periods. And, you know, there's data to show that the ovaries make at least a little bit of some estrogen, probably into your 60s. 
um, you know, past past the early 50s, it when is when it just becomes, you know, a continued risk benefit of, you know, you you used it for the initial purpose, which was to to reduce the risks of the things that that early met surgical menopause, you know, put you at risk for things like heart disease, your bone density, et cetera. Um, but there are certainly people who continue on their hormone replacement therapy. It continues to get reevaluated by your gynecologist or your endocrinologist who's ever managing your hormone replacement therapy. And for those who have undergone, I'm going to butcher this word again, salping, sal salping, 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 yep, salping, 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 how can they ensure that any kind of testing um, that took place after that surgery um, is accurate or, you know, yeah. double check so, on that? Yeah, so that, that's the protocol that I was, that I was mentioning. It's actually called the C-FIM, S-E-E-F-I-M. Um, and so, you know, most physicians and, and pathologists have, know about this. This has become, you know, standard of care and evaluated. But again, this is a, a question to ask and to say, you know, do you know if your pathologists make sure they look through the end of the fallopian tube in this particular way to make sure there's not a precancer there or even a cancer? Um, you know, 10 years ago, that was not what was being done. Um, much more known about now, but that's also a great question to ask your surgeon. Um, and, you, you know, they, they should probably be able to find out that answer. And if they can't, I would make sure you go somewhere that, that can find out that answer for you. And I'd love to just end, you know, on a more positive note, given this is, you know, a really difficult conversation and um, it's really hard to be, you know, young with, with faced with these kinds of options, um, young, under 40. Um, and I'd love to know what you, what do you foresee, Dr. Haggerty, in the next 10, 20 years as can we make any strides in this arena? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I absolutely. The knowledge that we have now in terms of, you know, where, where even ovarian cancer starts opens up incredible doors for research opportunities. And there are plenty of studies, trials, you know, working on, is there things that we can screen for in the blood? Are there ways to brush the inside of the fallopian tube and pick up something precancerous that can be done for true surveillance and it's not an abdominal surgery? So there are many, many researchers actively looking to find ways to screen you know, even to screen the general population, but obviously to even more so screen the people who we know at high, are at higher risk. That makes that that that's all wonderful to know, and um, it's it's great to continue to support the, that research. Um, so we like to um, keep everyone on on time, and we as we are so grateful uh, for everyone being here and coming to support. And again, a huge thank you to our panelists, Dr. Haggerty, Mora, and Katrina, um, who have so generously offered um, to give you guys their emails if you want, want to connect with them and follow up with any questions. Mora and Katrina are happy to, you know, share their stories and um, talk with talk with you guys. So um, again, thank you all so much for coming. And um, if you have any questions about the Basser Center or anything that we do, uh, please visit basser.org.